before we go into the hands-on session, we would like to have an introduction to what, what uh, plain language summaries are, why they are important, and how to translate a systematic review to plain language summaries. Summary. So this introductory session will be taken by an arbitrary Bizarro. Anna is already on call. Thank you now for joining us. So Hannah, Anna Beatrice Pizarro is a North scientist from Colombia. Evidence synthesis, systematic review methods. She's an evidence synthesis, systematic review methods, and knowledge translation expert with a focus on health equity. She's certified in clinical research through the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health. Currently, she's an active member of the editorial board of the Cochrane, and she's affiliated with the Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health in the city of New York. Thank you very much, Anna, for accepting this invite. Uh, the floor is now yours. Thank you. I'm really happy and glad to be here. I'm going to start sharing my slides, and please let me know if you can see them. Okay. Can you see them now? Yes, please, we can see your slide. Great, so um, I will start uh, this part of the workshop just with uh, like a quick theoretical part. Um, so um, I'm gonna first talk about what is a plain language summary. Um, the definition, it is a brief overview of research. Um, findings or complex information, and it is written in clear and accessible language. And the purpose is to make information understandable to non-experts, including patients, the general public, and policymakers. Um, the characteristics are that they are simple, clear language, and avoids jargon and technical terms. Uh, and then they are concise and to the point. And why are they important? First, for accessibility, it ensures that research is accessible to a bigger audience, including people without specialized knowledge. Also, it helps individuals to make informed decisions based on evidence uh, to give them empowerment. Transparency, because it promotes uh, this transparency in research and by making findings more understandable and usable. And engagement, because it increases public engagement with research, enhancing the impact and relevance of the studies. I'm gonna talk to you about uh, key elements of a plain language summary. I can see that there are some people in the waiting room. Um, um, and the elements are, First, the objective. So you have to start with a purpose, but a main question of the research. Then key findings uh, to summarize the main results or the conclusions and relevance to explain why the findings are important or what they mean for the audience. And some recommendations, it is not always applicable, but um, you can offer practical suggestions or implications of the findings. Now, uh, let's go to how to create a plain language summary. I'm gonna give you some steps. Um, the first one is to understand the audience and identify who the summary is for. Um, it's different if it's for patients or the public or policymakers, and that's something that you had gotta have um, super clear. Then the step two is to simplify the language. Also taking into account the audience, you are going to use a language that is going to be simple for that population. And step three, be concise. So you want to focus on the key points. You want to keep it brief and to the point. Um, and that's why it is a summary. So you want to keep it short. 
and uh, step four to use visuals. It is not always mandatory, but I think it's it's a great idea to incorporate diagrams or bullet points or charts uh, to promote that understanding. And then the next step is to review and revise. Do not do it alone. Um, we suggest to, for you to get feedback from non-experts to ensure the clarity and readability of the summary. And uh, some tips. Uh, for writing in plain language is to use active voice. For example, do not say um, that it was found that, that better that the researcher did it. Um, break down complex ideas so you can explain concepts in a step-by-step -step way or manner. Um, we also suggest to avoid acronyms, to spell out abbreviations, or avoid them if possible, and also to use examples and analogies. Um, so you can help explain an unfamiliar terms by relating them to the everyday concepts. Uh, and now, uh, this this was like general, and now we're gonna um, explain about the perspective from evidence set. Uh, first, how do we know that the summaries are useful? There was a study published in 2023 by Khalid. He was the lead author, and uh, it. I'm gonna I'm gonna paste the reference on the chat for you to to see the whole article. But I'm gonna summarize it a bit. So there are some challenges in decision makers that include insufficient time and increased burden of responsibilities during crisis, limited access to reliable internet connection, large volume of data not translated into user friendly summaries and later information available on preparedness and response measures. Um, also, if you're reading something on Cochrane and Evidence Safe website, uh, you will expect that it's something of good quality and that you can trust the evidence presented. Um, and how do we know these uh, summaries are useful? Because of this study, um, it was found that the decision makers, they like to see title, target audience, presentation of key findings and actionable checklist um, or infographic format, also implementation considerations, assessment of the quality of evidence presented, citation and hyperlink to the full review, funding sources, language of full review, and other sources of information of the topic. This study was developed um, an evidence summary template with accompanying training material to inform real-time decision-making in crisis setting. And how does evidence set, how do we summarize systematic reviews? Um, so first, uh, we decide on what should be included in the summary, along with the client and others. Uh, second, develop a writing guidance or a template that I'm gonna show you now. Three, obtain feedback from others. Um, for continuous feedback, look, improving and amending as required. Sometimes it takes a lot. And ensure policymakers that they like the products. So it is a feedback loop. So what next? Um, first, we identify a systematic review. We do allocate a writer that does uh, like the main um, summary. And then we have a checker. Um, the, dry, the writer does draft the summary. And we send it to the checker to ensure that there's a consistency with the template and accuracy of the content. Then the categories are assigned and the draft is sent to the finalizer, that is the senior researcher that um, he sent it to the operations manager for publication with it, the collection that I'm going to share uh, the link as well. Now we're going to demonstrate um, how the translation of these meta reviews are done into plain language summaries using our resilient health systems evidence collection as an example. So this collection, the main objective was to improve access to reliable created information for well-informed decisions on disasters and health emergencies. Remember that it might depend on your topic so this one is specifically for that. Uh, and we do summarize complex systematic reviews to lay writing for people across various languages. And uh, we do have 
the priority of implementing implementing and coordination to end user input, uh, the high quality research that is relevant to health emergencies, then we pick systematic reviews of such um, research that provide their reliable and robust evidence base. And uh, those summaries are at different levels of health emergency response and preparedness. So these are all the collections that we have. There are seven, not all, but these are like seven interconnected collections. But um, this one is specific for the resilient health systems where we do have over 200 summaries. So this is how you're gonna see the, with the website, the web page. Um, so you can see, uh, I'm gonna send the link as well or actually share my screen uh, to, the, to the website later. Uh, so this is the resilient health systems uh, website inside of evidence a the page and you can select um, the summary that you want to read it is translated to all of these languages and you search all the resources that we have okay now the the next slides you're gonna see they do have a lot of text but they're like literally our template um so here is, you start with the citation of the review. So you insert Vancouver style citation. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna show an example at the end so you can see it all complete. But here it is. Um, you first we do use the Vancouver style citation, and also for Cochrane reviews, we do put the city number. Then uh, the DOI. You just put it alone, not the URL. Then we paste the URL. And we also select if it is free to review or not. And the funding sources that we find in the, in the review. Um, sometimes they are reported, sometimes they are not. So it will depend if they said yes or no, or if they are not reported at all. In here, we do also select the language that that review was written in. Sometimes they are not only in one language, most of them are, uh, but you can see that some reviews, they do have the abstract available in multiple languages, especially the ones from the WHO bulletin. And also the reviews might be published in some other languages or translated and they are a publication as well. So we do. Then. <laughs> then we go with what is this? That it is a opening synthesis about that specific review. So for example, this three that we have. Building a resilient health system will improve its ability to continue to function during and after health emergencies and disasters. And you have some other two examples that they are going to be relevant of the topic for the review to this special collection. So they're, they're like an overview. And then this is um, one of the parts that I like the most of our template. First you go in this, and then you have this in the brackets. So you pick if it is a systematic review or if it's a Cochrane review or Campbell review or rapid or scoping, right? So you only leave the type of review that it is. Then over here, the authors search for, so you go to the inclusion criteria of that review and uh, you insert the type of studies, uh, study designs that were used. And if they were more, than one, then you can use the more generic term uh, of, and then what's the focus of the study in the setting. Then they restricted their searches to articles published in. So you're gonna use the same information that you extracted uh, and you check um, what were, this is mainly inclusion criteria of this. So you go in the methods of this review and check uh, what was the languages that of the search studies. And you also insert any other restrictions. For example, 
date or type of publication. Um, then you, or you can also say that they didn't restrict their searches by anything. And they did the search on that. You can find that on the methods as well is when was this search? It depends if it's a living review or aerobic review, uh, but usually they do have like the exact date. Then over, you just like finish with the methods section and then you go to the results, right? So here uh, they include it. So you find that on the results section of your review and then uh, how many studies that they include, the types and the countries of these studies. And um, sometimes there are some reviews that they, especially Cochrane reviews, they do have some ongoing studies or awaiting for assessment. So you include them in here, but if it's not a Cochrane review, then you don't need to include any of that. And then we go with what works and what was found that that is part of the uh, results as well. So you, we use works for reviews on the effects of interventions and what was found for other reviews, mainly the scripts reviews that they are like the most common type of reviews that we do summarize. Um, and what doesn't work, we use it uh, for these specific reviews that are on effect of interventions uh, because otherwise you wouldn't know that they, that they don't work or we delete the section for other reviews where, uh, where we use what was found. So the template's gonna change if it's a what what works or what was found. Um, and if what's and if it's not applicable, then we write nothing about it. Um, we suggest to only include an intervention here uh, if there's evidence of no effect or or evidence of harm that outweighs benefits, rather than a lack of evidence for benefits of harms. That's something else. And then uh, what is uncertain, we use this one for reviews of effects of interventions or we delete it for other reviews where you have used what was found as well. And if the evidence of the review is insufficient to conclude that something is beneficial, we include it in here as well, rather than under what doesn't work. Then we go to the implications that if, if those authors stated some implications, but sometimes it is not applicable, so we state nothing noted. And uh, there are some other considerations um, because the authors of the review sometimes discuss, in, this is mainly on the discussion, but you can also find it in the conclusion that they did uh, discuss their findings in different contexts. We do use uh, the progress plus. And so if they did it on place of residence, race, ethnicity, culture, and language, occupation, gender, sex, and religion, education, socioeconomic status, social capital, personal characteristics associated with discrimination, and uh, or time-dependent relationships. Or if the authors didn't discuss it, but mostly they do, but um, sometimes they don't, so we just say that they did not discuss their findings in this context. Thank you. Uh, I'm just gonna show you really quick um how it looks like a, a real summary. Let me see. Okay, I have it right here. This is our website. I'm going to share the link to this to the, um, to the chat as well. And how, here you can browse on the Resilient Health System collection. And these are all the all these summaries that are already prepared and you can see the date that they were added. There are some filters that you can also use. Uh, and this is what I showed you that you can find them in different languages because they have been translated. But let's go like to the first one, for example. And this is what I just showed you, um, like a real one. So this is the title that we give to it. This is the citation. 
language, if it was free to review, the funding sources, what is this? That is like the short uh, summary of results, then what was found, the implications and other considerations. You might see that there are some uh, summaries that might be longer than other ones because of their complexity or the topic, but this is mainly it. And uh, I'm gonna stop sharing now and uh, we'll see if, if there are some questions that pop up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, for the presentation. Uh, so please, participant would like to get your questions on what has been done so far before we yeah, go I into see, the hands on. I, okay. I see that there, there's one uh, from Jusra. She says, could you please confirm if there are any publication fees associated with the submission? Uh, do you mean publicating in the evidence set website, right? So no, there are no there are no fees to publish. Uh, Jay can also answer this one. But do you have but, but like we don't have like a submission system? Do you have to be a volunteer of us? in order um, to publish our, the summaries there and you also like receive training and the feedback. So it's not that you like pick a review and write the summary and send it to us, but it is like a different process. Like I just showed you that it goes um, in different phases, but also uh, we do pick the reviews uh, carefully on topics that we are interested on or that they do, or that they are part of our specific collection. I don't know if you, you would like to add anything else, Jay, but it was mainly that. No, yeah, that's perfect. We do have, uh, like Anna said, we have collections that um, are pretty specific. So we have like COVID and Ebola and Zika and a couple others. I think there's 11 of them. Um, and we have had people send emails to us that are not part of the organization, um, letting us know that there's a really good review out there. They do have to be systematic reviews or meta-analysis. So as long as they're, they fall within that criteria and that it's a good research, um, generally we will publish it. So it's just a matter of sending us an email and then somebody from our team kind of reviews it and sees if we can, uh, we can publish it on our website. Yeah, just in a small cases, we do include rapid reviews or scoping reviews, but that also depends, like, for example, during COVID that we didn't have, like, uh, I don't want to say, like, big quality reviews, but because of we needed, like, information very quickly, so we couldn't, like, wait until there were, like, systematic reviews published. Okay, thank you very much. And I would like to ask... Um... A question. Uh, one of the things that uh, participants have asked us is if they could, you know, translate or summarize their own reviews and where would they potentially publish these reviews, their own personal reviews, for maybe uh, a wider dissemination or communication of their, of their work. So please let me know if that is something that they can do. Um, would, would you like to answer that one, Jay? Uh, sure. Um, so currently we are not publishing reviews uh, at Evidence Aid. We had a really huge backlog. So uh, we're just getting through those right now. We, we're still publishing them on our website, but we're not taking any new ones in. Um, but that being said, feel free to contact us. Uh, I will send the evidence aid email. Um, we do have a spreadsheet where we keep all of our potential reviews uh, that we plan to do in the future. So you can always send it to us and we can kind of review it at a glance, see if we can publish it on our website and then get back to you. Um, but as of right now, we are not publishing any new um, articles.
Oh, sorry. I think my question wasn't clear. Uh, can you hear me, Jay? Yes. Yep. Okay. So the question we received from participant, this is from last uh, session, uh, last year when we did a similar event. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted to know, aside from evidence aid, use of plain language summaries, can individuals who have worked on systematic reviews translate or summarize their own systematic reviews and maybe publish it? The question is, where can they publish such plain language summaries? Okay. Um, I would, I mean, I would say at Evidence Aid, but because we're not publishing them, uh, that would be out of the question for now. But Anna, do you know anywhere else that they might be able to publish plain language summaries of their own research? I don't know what's the moment, but maybe we could look and like send you more information about this. Mm -hmm. That is a good question. Yeah, I know that there are like some blogs that also publish that, especially now for the, uh, what's the name, like, Healthcare Board Evidence Healthcare Day, mm -hmm. um, maybe with JBI or Campbell, but we will have to check first. Okay, thank you very much for the response. Thank you for your question. So we have, <laughs> yeah, we have a question here. Okay, I think you've answered it um, from Greece. Greece said, could these be applied to landscape reviews? Yeah, of course, like any summary, like you can summarize any type of review, specifically in evidence that we don't use, we don't do use landscape reviews, but this information that we just provided, it applies to any type of review that you would like to summarize. Okay, so Anna, there is another question here. Yeah? Can plain language summaries be uh, published or I believe would, would be written for already published reviews? Oh, that, I yes. think the person is, okay, okay. Yeah, um, we do publish, uh, like we do write plain language summaries for public reviews only. We don't use real literature or anything else. And thank you everyone for the comments of the great presentation. I'm so glad you liked it. All right, so please let us know if there are other questions. We'll be happy to take them. Um, following Jacqueline's question, they are not always open access and that's why we do have that section in our template to see if they are free to review or not, but we do find a way to get the full text and summarize it. I see there's another one from Moses. It's, it says, as beginning researcher, at what stage of my research journey should I be contemplating writing a plain language summary uh, I think at any stage, you don't have to, of course, you have to know how to, I think the only thing you have to know is like how to read and interpret a system of review or specific type of review. But um, when I started with um, Evidence Set, it was about four or five years ago, and I didn't have much work experience, but I did, I, I had written system of reviews. So uh, it was um, easy for me to start writing the summaries that um, I think anyone with a health science background, research background, even though if it's not big, but you like know how to read papers and interpret them, um, you are able to start. And uh, of course that your first summary doesn't have to be uh, the, 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 the perfect one. Um, even though like five years, five years later, I still get feedback. And that's that's the whole process. Like you don't have to feel bad if someone tells you to improve it because at the end you are always under a senior researcher or someone else. But um, yeah, like I think that 
the hardest part is to start, like to actually take the decision to do it. And then you will like go back and forth, but learning is. Jay, do you want to say anything else? That was a wonderful answer. I think you're right. I think the hardest part is starting. Um, my first plain language summary that I wrote didn't sound very good. And I found it was very difficult to pick what information was important in a plain language summary because you have a, like a very small amount of words to to write it. Um, so it's a it's a, definitely a learning process. But as long as you start and you have somebody who can mentor you and kind of maybe review your work, I think starting as early as possible is great. Um, Jusra has another question. It says, should we submit a PLS in the selected language or should we submit it in English for translation? Jay? Um, so at Evidence Aid, we only do it, the initial article that's written in English, we do, we do the plain language summary in English and then we translate it through translation. Trans translators Without Borders, uh, which is a non for profit um, that translates all sorts of all sorts of work, but they are very kind to help us. They've been working with us for a very long time. Um, that being said, if you're comfortable in that language, I think it would be okay to submit it a plain language summary in a in a different language, as long as the initial review is written in that language and that you feel comfortable translating it. Um, because there's also nuances in in you know the way that um, languages are spoken versus how uh, research is written. So you just have to kind of be careful with that. As long as you have, if you're comfortable writing in that language, I think it should be okay in English or whatever language it was it was written in. Thank you. Okay. You want to say something? Oh, no. I was just going to say, I think there might be a question for you if the recording uh, is going to be shared by email. Yes. The recording uh, will be shared. Uh, so, Hannah and uh, Jay, I'm just uh, wondering if um, all the questions might come after the hands on. So, maybe if you don't mind, Jay, we could go ahead with the second session. So, um Anna, do you have some final uh um words to give us? Please. <laughs> Just thank you for attending. Um, I know that there's a lot of people here, and thank you for your effort to joining. And I hope uh, that you learned. And also, I'm gonna drop my email in case you have any other question. And uh, double feel. Oh, thank you very much, Hannah. So, uh, thank you for uh, taking us through the introductory aspects. So now we'll be moving to the hands-on workshop and we will be dividing ourselves into breakout rooms and we'll be trying out writing clean language summaries. So the facilitator for this second session is uh, Jay Wariwa Karim. Jay is already, <clears throat> excuse me, Jay is already on call here with us. So Jay has a master's in global health from McMaster University, uh, having specialized in health management. She's interested in globalization, social policy and health politics. She has research experience regarding various topics of health, including stroke rehabilitation, mental health, and COVID vaccine hesitancy. Currently, Jay is supporting Evidence Aid with business development and managing the summary writing and publishing process and works in a local urgent care center as a medical assistant. So Jay, we're really happy to have you join us and we're really looking forward to engaging this session with you.
Thank you, Fortune. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm so happy with the turnout. Um, thank you, Anna, for kind of setting the foundation for what we're going to do next. Um, so, yes, I think somebody is unable to hear us, but um, everybody else can hear me okay? Yeah, okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay, so for the next part of the workshop, we're going to... Um, put our plain language summary writing skills to use. So I think somebody was commenting about when we should get started writing our plain language summaries. And I guess the answer is right now. Um, so what will happen is I'm going to share some instructions. So Evidence Aid already obviously has a huge collection of plain language summaries that we've written for a whole bunch of articles um, across different topics. Um, we've we've uh, picked a couple for you guys, um, and I will just share my screen now so that I can show you all. Okay, so we've picked four plain. Sorry, we've picked four articles. Um, one about climate change. One about refugees and asylum seekers, one about malnutrition, and the final one about Ebola. Um, these four articles are systematic reviews um, that Evidence Aid has already written plain, plain language summaries uh, for, but we will get you guys to just pick one and write a plain language summary. So it should be about 200 to 300 words. I think this is a little bit more than what we do at Evidence Aid, um, but it's a little bit easier to work with, especially for the first time. So I will share this document that way. Let me just find the chat. Uh, that way you guys can have access to it. Um, but once you have picked your article, um, you can copy and paste these subheadings. These are very similar to the ones that Anna showed us um, from the evidence aid template, but it is a little bit more refined. Evidence aid has its own specific set of goals and rules and things that we follow that aren't necessarily necessary for writing a plain language summary um, for the very first time. So I would recommend um, when you pick your article to do a Vancouver style citation and then go through the article and figure out the answers to these questions. So this will answer what is this? And it'll include the type of study used, um, the type of studies used, which countries they were set in, when the search was done, from what date the articles used were from, um, if there were any restrictions to search, and then how many articles were included, and again, from which countries, that should not be repeated. Um, so this could be like two to three sentences. Usually this is the longest section. And then what was found by the researchers. So this is kind of the, the conclusion that the um, that the, the researchers came up with. Um, this could be one to two sentences as well. And then what are the implications of this research and the results? This is something that's not always present in the articles. So it'll take a little bit to kind of um, see if it's present or not. If there's nothing noted by the by the article authors, you could just write nothing noted. But um, examples of this could include um, why this research is kind of important. So if the article uh, authors make comments about what this research is being used for, so if they say this should be used by policymakers, um, or this could include things like um, what the future of this research could look like. So in the future, if, if they've recommended further research, um, that could be included here as well. So I think that's pretty much it. Uh, and then the, in the third step, we will compare the summary that you've written with one provided by Evidence Aid uh, about the same article, uh, but I will provide that after we've already written our summaries. So for the next 20 minutes, uh, we will be focusing on writing the summaries. I think Fortune will place everybody in a breakout room and we will then um, take the 20 minutes to write the summaries. I think me and Anna will filter through the breakout rooms just to see if anybody needs help or support. And then we will take 20 minutes um, also in the breakout rooms to kind of go through the articles and see um, 
what evidence aid has written versus what you have written and where things could be uh, changed. And then we'll come back here, I think, for the for the ending five minutes or so. Yes, yeah, thank you very much, Helen. Uh, so, no, Hannah, um, and, and, and can you hear me? Okay, somebody's saying she can't hear you. Uh, sorry, Jay. <laughs> Yes. Jay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, I'm going to create um twelve breakout rooms, and um, because we have four topics, so we're going to have three breakout rooms per topic, uh, three for climate change, three for health and of refugees, three for uh malnutrition, and three for Ebola. Please, is that okay by you? That sounds great. Okay. Fine. Just give me a, a minute. So, and uh, sorry, Jay, could you please go over the instructions again? Because I can see that uh, I think there's a question in the chat box asking for clarification. Uh, of course. So the next 20 minutes will be spent in the breakout rooms. I think Fortin is going to um, make breakout rooms based off of which article you're picking. So there's going to be, there's four topics of the articles, climate change, refugees, malnutrition, and Ebola. I've sent the instructions in the chat. If you just look for my name, um, I've sent it as a document. So um, actually, you know what, what might even be easier is if I just copy and paste the instructions into the chat. That way, whoever can't open it is able to. Um, so that's part one, is just picking which article you're interested in. And then part two is writing the actual plain language summary. So you'll have 200 to 300 words. Um, and then you just have to look through the article and pick out the information that you think would be appropriate for a plain language summary. In order to help facilitate this, I've provided subheadings. So you can just copy and paste the subheadings and it'll kind of help guide you to write your plain language summary. Um, and then the final part of this will be to have Anna and I go into the rooms and uh, we'll do a, lo a little bit of a comparison um, between the summary that's written by you versus the one that was written by evidence aid. So I hope that clarified. Um, oh, I think I'm over the word count, but... Hmm. Yep, I don't think I can send it in the chat. Okay, we're gonna have to send this in parts. So those are the first three. And those are the other two articles that you guys can pick from. And then part two is right here. Okay, uh, please, the breakout yes. rooms are ready. So when, whenever you want us to start, you can let me know. Perfect. Okay. Oh, I think in, uh, um, yes, Vishal, of course, you can go to the breakout room for refugee and asylum seekers. So I think, um, let me just see. Uh, Fortune, are they, are, participants able to go into the breakout rooms themselves or do you have to place them in the breakout rooms? Uh, yeah, we're, we're setting it for them to choose the breakout rooms to go into. Okay, perfect. I'm just trying to find it myself. So if you already know which breakout rooms you want to go to and you can see the breakout rooms at the bottom of the screen, just feel free to go into that room. But I, as of right now, cannot see it. I don't know, Anna, can you see the breakout rooms? Oh, you know what? I see it now. It says join breakout rooms. Oh, sorry. I, sorry, I want to ask the rooms. Do, do you see the <laughs> Do you see the names yeah. on the, the room title? It, just, it says room one to, to, through 12. Oh, my God. Uh, okay. I'm just going to... Sorry. I thought I looked to see it. 
ओके सॉरी सॉरी आई हैव टू क्लोज इट एंड 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 स्टार्ट ऑल ओवर आई एम सॉरी अबाउट दैट नो वरीज आई थिंक इट विल गिव पीपल अ चांस टू जस्ट लुक थ्रू द आर्टिकल्स एंड सी व्हिच वन दे लाइक यू कैन फील फ्री टू स्टार्ट एज वेल गोइंग थ्रू द स्टफ या आई सी दैट देयर आर अबाउट 40 पीपल ऑन दिस लिंक दैट यू शेयर्ड सो दैट्स ग्रेट Yeah, so well, please, while waiting for the breakout rooms, please, uh, like uh, Jay has said, maybe we can go through different articles, uh, I mean, just briefly, uh, to decide on which um, topic we'd like to work on. Mm -hmm. um, Jacqueline has asked, do we choose randomly? Y you can choose whichever one you feel interested in. So the climate change one is called water related impacts of climate change on agriculture and sub subsequently on public health. Um, this one is particular to Pakistan. Um, there's one about refugee and asylum seekers. So it's a meta review of school-based disaster interventions for schools and uh, for children and ad adolescent survivors. The one about malnutrition is called um, a systematic review and meta-analysis analysis assessing the impact of droughts, flooding, and climate variability on malnutrition. And finally, the one about Ebola is called Assessing the Concepts and Designs of 58 Mobile Apps for the Management of the 2014-2015 West African Ebola Outbreak. And this is a systematic review as well. So um, feel free to look through those. The links are... There is hyperlinks in that Word document. If you click on the article title, it'll take you directly to the um, original article. You can just review it a little bit, see if you like that. Oh, it looks like the breakout rooms might be ready. Perfect. Thank you, Fortune. It looks good now. I can see the titles. Uh, so uh, you could see, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm referring to the participant now. There is a button in front of your screen. It's like a four box. You see join breakout room, you click it, and then you, you join the one you want to join. So if you're experiencing difficulty joining, you could let us know, please. Not be husband, not parents. Their parents don't die. Neminapo, neminapo. May them not make Bob you able to make Bob you. Like this, always make sure that. As you have a couple of people, we have a couple of people that kind of go back and forth and decide on if it's appropriate to just include Pakistan after they've re read the entirety of the information, uh, the article. So I think it was decided to just say, uh, the cl climate change impacts in Pakistan, and then they searched in June 2016 Hi. for any type of. Oh. Hi, Jay. Yes. Could you please increase um the side the zoom in zoom your screen um someone like is complaining. This? Is that better? To me, it's fine. I don't know what it. Yeah, means. perfect, perfect, perfect. Perfect. Okay. No. Sounds yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you for letting me know. 
that's really helpful. Um, okay, so where were we? Uh, so they've included when the search was done and the type of articles published from 1980 on 80 and onwards. Uh, so from what date they, they started looking at the articles, um, it's important, obviously, because the articles published in 1980 and onwards are very different than the ones if you were just to pick the ones from the last 10 years, for example. Um, so that's the importance of the what is this section. It kind of gives an idea uh, to the reader about what they're about to read and what kind of limitations there were put in place. And if this was a good enough research article for them to use for whatever they're using for policy making, for a project, for whatever goals they might have. Then the what was found section. Um, it says floods contaminate groundwater, erode soil, and increase waterborne and other infections. Approaches to mitigate water related impacts on health in countries comparable to Pakistan involve national bodies and key stakeholders. They include lifestyle changes to reduce water scarcity. So, this section comes from the discussions. Um, obviously, there's a lot to go through. Yeah, this is the right article. So, what I like to do when I'm writing plain language summaries, which not everybody follows because everybody's different. Um, but if you go to the discussion section, it's up here. This is technically where the discussion section starts. Um, they've included subheadings and it kind of gives you a guide to see what kind of, um, what kind of over overhead topics they've picked as important in order to talk about. So, I actually would have written this, what was found section, keeping in mind these subheadings. And I think that is the way to go um, because it makes sure that you're not missing anything. So some sections are a lot smaller than others. This one's quite large. This one's a little bit shorter. So your the way that you write it in your plain language summary might reflect that. Um, it looks like they have included most, if not all of the subheadings. But the way they've written it is a little bit different than the subheadings that were listed over here. Uh, and then finally, I think we have this final section is called implication. And the author of the review suggested the great awareness of the link between agriculture, public health, and economy is needed by both the scientific community and general public. Furthermore, there was a need for adaptation and mitigation efforts, conservation, and risk management in response to climate change. The author of the review stated that laws and policy measures should be improved. So if you notice, everything that's written here is directly from the article. Implications, the implication section can make you want to kind of put your own opinion into things, why this research was important. That's basically what it's answering. Um, but you can't do that because it's a plain language summary. You're summarizing somebody else's work, not giving your own opinion. So in this, this, this section sometimes is not commented on by um, authors of, of articles although it should be technically. And it's usually found in the recommendations for further work section and the conclusion. So they'll usually comment on things like what this, the importance of this research is um, and, and what further research could be done. Um, so this was the very first one that we did. Um, I think maybe we can wait for questions until the very end, just because we don't have a lot of time. So that was the first one. The second one uh, we have is called a, a meta review of school-based disaster interventions for child and adolescent survivors. Uh, this one is for refugee of health and asylum seekers. So it's the exact same thing. You've got this section. Um, this one is not free to view. So um, this is the importance of, of doing plain language summaries because in this case, somebody who didn't have access to the review would probably not be able to uh, get as much out of the paper because they only have the abstract. So hopefully somebody did have the review. I actually didn't realize that this one was not free to view. Um, but what in the what is the section, same thing. So in the systematic review, the author searched for peer reviewed literature about intervention programs for children and adolescents exposed to disasters caused by men or by natural disasters. They restricted their search to articles published in English between 2000 and 2015. The authors included 11 articles from 10 countries. 
So this is a little bit different than the last one. It has a little bit of a different spin on it. There's a little bit more information I think that's included. Um, you'll notice that they didn't include when the search was done, only when the articles they included were published. Um, if you can't find that information, you don't have to include it. Um, so let me just see if there's anything else on here. Yeah, so the what was work, what work section, they found psychoeducation and cognitive behavioral therapy were used more frequently after disasters caused by natural hazards. Often these interventions were delivered by teachers, school-based post-disaster mental health and psychosocial support efforts reduced post-traumatic stress symptoms. Um, so if we go to the article, mm, this is not the right one. I'm sorry, my, my screen has become stuck. Oh, there we go. So if you go to the article, you will be able to find this section. Um, well, I mean, th this is not free to view, but you would be able to find the section in the discussion section. Um, I also did not write this article either, but I think this was from, Oh, it's from August 2024. So it was a more more recent one, but this one was one that we had um we had reviewed and rewritten um because I I believe there was an older version of this that we had written and then we changed our template. So like again, um even when you're writing your own versions of these plain language summaries, it's important for you to kind of do it to begin with and then compare your work to other plain language summary writers. Everybody has a different spin on it. Um, but this was what was noted. The way that we've written this, it looks like the subheadings are a little bit different because it's an intervention and not a, um, uh, they looked for interventions and that's why they ha it has a what work section. What doesn't work, it wasn't noted. So that was not included. This one has a what was, what is uncertain section as well. We only write what works, what doesn't work and what is uncertain if it's um, interventions that are being looked at. So that's why the language is a little bit different here as well. It says interventions that involve creative expression and body-oriented strategies may be beneficial. Outcomes for interventions that incorporate physical exercise, art therapy, and narrative stories to memory to aid memory reconstructions were uncertain. Um, yeah, so this is something that was explicitly noted in the article um, if we had it free to view. And then implications, the author of the review stated that Cross-cultural research was needed to determine transferability to different contexts. So these last two sections, um, they're very similar. We include other considerations uh, and the other consideration sections that evidence aid includes um, is part of the equity uh, component that we have at evidence aid. So the authors of the review discuss their findings, usually in terms of uh, like age or sex or um, socioeconomic status or age different number of different things and that's something that's important for us to let other people know about um because it lets us know how um how this research can be applied to other groups if it's appropriate or not so this one was the second one and this one's the last one and we have uh we've done three so far that was who? Nope, I think we're missing this one. So we can do M Health next, actually, while that one loads. Um, accessing the concepts and design of 58 mobile apps for the management of West African. Ebola outbreak in 2014 and 2015. Uh, we actually talked with the with the author of this article. He's the one who uh, provided it to us um, because he wanted to. Oh, because he wanted to know if it would be appropriate to put up on our website for other people to to see and use, um, specifically policymakers. So 
In the systematic review, the author searched for articles related to mHealth tools during the 2014-2015 outbreak of Ebola virus disease in West Africa. They included articles published in languages between 2014 and 2015, and the authors found 58 studies. Um, that was the, what is this section? Again, this was found in the methods. What was found, this was, I think, a little bit easier to translate. Uh, I remember a colleague of mine translated this one. And we talked about it. Uh, so community care, sense Ebola follow-up and surveillance, outbreak response management and analysis were the only three applications capable of surveillance, contact tracing, case management, and data analysis. Um, so they've explicitly stated this in their discussion section and in their conclusion. So it's very easy for somebody to pick this out and to put in the what was found section. Um, this is easier than, than the other articles where you kind of have to delve a little bit deeper and see if there's any themes that they've outlined that are more relevant. Um, whereas this is the names of, of three applications that were effective. And then in the implications, the authors state that ComCare, Sense, Ebola follow-up and SORMAS could guide further development of mHealth tools for the infectious disease surveillance and outbreak management. Um, so this was stated by by the the um, the authors um, explicitly in the conclusion section. Um, I remember when I was in, in one of the rooms, somebody asked if the implications have to use the word implications, and that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes the authors will kind of uh, make their own um, little section um, in the conclusion section saying that this is why this is important. This is why this research was important. This is the implication of this research without using the word implication. And um, this is what could be further done. And that's pretty much the, the kind of language that they use. So you can keep an eye out for that. And then again, um, the other consideration section in this one, they did, they did not um, make any commentary or use their findings to discuss anything in the context of health equity. So people can tell, can this this information be transferred to other groups, other socioeconomic groups, um, or otherwise. And I think this is the last one. So this is about climate change. Um, and it's called the systematic review and meta-analysis assessing the impact of drought flooding and climate variability on malnutrition. Yes. So I think this would probably be the most ideal kind of very evidence aid review. And you'll, you'll understand why I'm saying this. Um, so this information we've already gone through. The what is this section in this systematic review and meta-analysis, which is kind of what we do at Evidence Aid, that's our focus. The author search for studies that examine the relationship between proxy factors for climate change, drought, flooding, and climate variability, and malnutrition. I would also like to note this very beginning sentence is probably the most important part of the plain language summary. If you get this wrong, then people automatically have an they they have no idea what you're talking about. They have an idea of what you've said. Um, and if you get it wrong, then they're going to read the rest of what you've written based off of information that was wrong. So it's important to very explicitly outline what kind of review this was. And then on top of it, usually in an article in the very beginning, either at the end of the introduction um, or, yeah, usually at the end of the introduction, they will say that for, for all of these listed reasons, for this background, this is this is the reason that we're doing this article. And they'll mention what was what, what the whole article is about. So you have to make sure you get that right. And then in this article, they restricted their searches to studies published in English. So see, this is important because they did not include any other articles published in any other language. And they've explicitly said that. So if they don't say that, you don't need to include that. Um, during or after 2000, and those that relied on clinical metrics such as stunting, wasting, and undernutrition. They included 22 studies from India, Ethiopia, Kenya, Bangladesh, Lesotho, Mali, Mexico, Mozambique, Pakistan, and four studies that uh, reported results from multiple countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So one of the other articles they did include, um, I think they said we the article included studies from 10 countries, um, but they never actually listed the countries. In this case, this article is very comprehensive. They've listed where they've gotten their information from. This makes me think, okay, this is a really good article because they're very explicit about where they got their information from when they did their, like what timeline uh, they're using the articles from. Um, 
In the what was found section, the authors found a strong positive relationship between drought flooding and climate variability and at least one clinical metric of malnutrition. This is included in the discussion section, probably. Um, it, this is a little bit on the shorter side, but again, because we're human beings writing this, this is what the article writer thought was appropriate to write. Um, in the implication section, to reduce the adverse influence of droughts, flooding, and climate variability on malnutrition and population health, the authors recommended adaptation strategies such as sustainable agriculture and education for women and girls. So you guys will see a trend now. The implication section is, I think, maybe one of the harder parts to write uh, because, again, it's not so clear. They usually don't use the word implications, but the trend is that it's usually about some sort of recommendation the author has made. Um, about future work that needs to be done and usually about the importance of the work that they're doing. So that's pretty much it. And then in this article, they have included um, discussing their findings in the context of residence, gender, education, age, and socioeconomic status. So again, this is like a really good article because they've, they've kind of done that. They've um, included that context component of it. Um, I would recommend everybody actually read this article. It's a very good one. And all of these, that's pretty much it. Those are the four that we looked at. Everybody picked one. Um, that is the end of my description of all of these. I hope it was helpful. Um, these are all posted on our Evidence Aid website. So if you just go to the Evidence Aid website and search up the first name of the author, it should show up um, sometimes many of these articles have been written by the same author. So just keep that in mind. I'm just going to stop sharing. Uh, I think we've, we're one minute over. Um, so I don't know if we have any time for questions. I'm happy to stay for a couple of minutes if anybody has any really important questions. Um, but otherwise I can also give my email to Fortune and then um, we can we can go from there as well. Thank you guys for listening. I know that was a little bit, that was a lot at the very end, um, but I was just keeping in mind the time. Uh, otherwise, I would have liked to see what you guys had written as well. I did go through the rooms and I did see what you guys were writing. Everybody seemed like they were on the right track. Um, Charles, I think you have a question really quick. Yes, um, thank you, Jay. Um, uh, perhaps when you when you share the email, I also want to you know share with you what I have done. Mm -hmm. um, um, on my own on this group, at least give me an, an honest feedback. Um, yeah. um, another thing I wanted to um, point out is that um, from the summary here, from the PLS here, mm -hmm. I could see there are there are key uh, um, subheadings like, like that are state, you know that, that they are they are they are static, like the citation, the language, the access, um, uh, the funding source. What is it? Mm -hmm. uh, then after what? What? What is this? Some other ones had some other subheadings that are different from others. But again, yes, all, all of them had that implication and um, uh, mm -hmm. what implication and some other just those kind of nuances. So so um like like I said, I want to share my work with you so they can okay. also do. I'm not going to alter it with what I've seen now. I'll just send it the way I've done it so that you can also look at it and just give me those kind of feedback on what of I've done. Of course, over. yeah. Feel free. Feel free to do that. I'm happy to look through and see. Um, I think Dorothy also, you have a question? Good question. Thank you. Um, this this is new to me, but I'm glad I did it. But while I was doing this, and then based on um, when you were speaking just a few minutes ago, how um, ethical will it be for someone that didn't get access to, uh, let's say, an article that is paywalled, but reads um, a PLA mm -hmm. and then uses that as a basis to cite a particular article. Uh, I'm trying to, to just oppose those two things because you know when you are going to mm -hmm. cite an article, it is assumed that you have read the complete article. And mm -hmm. uh, we know that when you're writing these plain language summaries,
from what I have seen today, because until you mentioned that um, implication should not be what you think about that article, but what the original uh, um, authors had posited as the implication from their study. So now um, having to balance someone writing the plain um, summary and then uh, um, I picking it as maybe a researcher, I'm basing that as like I have read the complete article and then citing that article. So that's mm -hmm. where I'm looking at. How do we balance that? Or do we just go ahead and cite it as picked from Evidence Aid website or something? So mm. I need clarity there. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very, very good question. And as somebody who like recently finished my master's. Um, I think this is something that new researchers face a lot because there's so much research. And I think the easy thing would, to do would be to just cite a plain language summary and say, I, I like the, the stuff that they've said in this plain language summary and it's applicable to what I need to write about and I'm just going to cite it. But the more ethical way to do this would be to read the plain language summary and then to contact the author and get full access or somehow in another way, find full access. When we pick articles for our website, that's exactly what we do. So we have people who are on the team who are um, from like academic settings and they do have access through their own, their own, um, whatever they have, their own accounts or whatever through the school. And they have access to usually free versions of things. There, we do come across some that we don't have access to from anybody on the team and we have to directly contact the author. They're always very, very kind. They always share it. I've never had a case where they haven't shared it. Usually I've heard this. I don't actually know if this is the case all the time, but when things are hidden behind a paywall, um, it's usually not because the author wants it to be hidden behind a paywall. Usually that money is being given to the organization that runs the paywall. Um, if you contact the author directly, they're usually more than willing to just give it to you for free. Um, but the reason it's behind a paywall is because they need to get their research up and maybe that's the only option that they have. So to answer your question, I think, um, I, I personally don't think it would be ethical to cite a plain language summary. Plain language summaries are used in order to make research available in a very um, understandable way to a lot of people. So used by other researchers, it's wonderful and it definitely can be used by other researchers. But it's more so for people who aren't part of the research community, who don't understand the jargon, and who would probably benefit from this plain language as opposed to reading the actual article. But if you're as, as a researcher using it, I would recommend going straight to the source, reading the entire thing um, after you've been engaged by a plain language summary. So I hope that answers your question. That's kind of long winded. Yes, it does perfectly. Thank you. OK, no problem. Bernard? Yes, um, I think my, my question has been already answered. You just made a comment. I was trying to find out uh, whether the PLS is, is done, it can be done by anybody or it should be in a professional space, maybe in a form of a, yes. So like you just made a comment that the, you know, you are, you are conducting a research and you want to, uh, you know, make this PLS and in order to maybe uh, uh, make the, the work very much more simpler. So mm -hmm. I, I think, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. got, I, if you can do more light on it too, I'll be very glad. Sure, no worries. Yeah, I, I personally, this is my personal opinion, I think research needs a middleman. So somebody who's done the research, they're super into it, they understand the jargon, uh, they're very passionate about their work, but maybe they're not the best person to kind of talk about it to the general population. And that's where evidence aid comes in with the plain language summaries. Anybody can come in with the plain language summary. The only thing is this person needs to be able to understand the jargon part of it and the very specific language that's used. They need to have maybe a little bit of background about the topic. And they also need to be able to have that writing skill of writing the plain language summary. So I don't think it's necessarily one specific person that should be writing plain language summaries or specifically in professional spaces. But I do think that that person needs to have the confidence of the research um, sort of background, um, as well as being able to write the plain language summary, if that makes sense. Yes, 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 please. 
Thank you. Perfect. No problem. So I don't think anybody else has any questions. We have gone a bit over time, 10 minutes. Um, he usually does not have time to read the entire research. Absolutely right, Charles. It definitely is. We have actually had people, um, so people in public health, people who are actual policymakers and decision makers. We have huge organizations like PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization. They also use it. And um, I think at times they might even cite the work in order to get certain ideas across to the general public. So that's actually been really interesting. We did one, um, a huge collection with the Pan American Health Organization on resilient health systems, and it was used in order to make policies. But the dual function that it also has is anybody who wants to read about it because COVID affected everybody across the globe, they're able to do that. In fact, I've read through some of the work and I'm like, okay, that's very interesting. There's some interventions um, that were really interesting to me that were part of that collection. So yes, thank you for the comment, Charles. Any other lingering thoughts or comments? Um, I will I will send Fortune my email address so you guys can feel free to send your questions or comments over. But if not, I'll hand it back to Fortune. Thank you so much, Fortune, for staying on for the lingering questions. Uh, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, first, please, participant, we have a link uh for 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 your feedback so please could you spare a minute or two and share with us your feedback we want to know what you think about the workshop and of course we're hoping to improve on um whatever aspect of the workshop we have not done well and of course we'd like to share the feedback with the facilitator as well so please take a minute or two to feel the feedback from thank you Okay, so uh, Jay will be Jay will be sharing the email with me later. Okay, great. So what 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 we can say now is you could share, <clears throat> excuse me, you could share the work to our ACSRM email. I'll try to get it across to Jay. So just a minute. Jay, is that okay? Uh, to, to send these. Yeah, I mean, for those that have worked on a, a summary, they would share to our email oh. and then oh, we could forward it to you. Sounds great. Sounds great. Okay, fantastic. So thank you very much, everybody. We hope that you enjoyed uh, the good time with Jay and Anna. Thank you very much, Jay, for honoring this invitation and for taking us through and for staying through uh, the workshop. We really appreciate your efforts. No uh, problem. Thank you very much, ACSRM team, for the work in the background and everything you've been doing to support. Thank you very much, participant. We look forward to uh, having you next time. Can we please request that you put on your camera so we can take a group photo? Okay, so while we're doing that, please feel free to follow us on all, all our social media handles. We've been sharing the link on our chat. We also have a WhatsApp community. We have the Google Group community. So these communities are there to support you uh, at any stage in the systematic review process. We have mentors. We have uh, uh, other collaborators who will be happy to work with you. Hello. Hello. Yeah, hello. Please, just a quick one. I want to find out whether I'll be giving certificates. Of oh, no. Unfortunately, there'll be no certificate of participation for this okay. one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So please, could we please put on our camera? Thank you. Thank you very much. Taking the screenshot now. Yeah, I'm taking it. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to see so everyone's nice see faces. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just waiting for. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Jay, do you have final words? No, just that um, I hope everybody has a lovely rest of your day. It was lovely meeting all of you guys and good luck. Everything. 
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank please you for well, everything. Thank you. Do also send your summary to our email. Do have a nice day. Thank you. Okay. See you next time. Bye.